talking about um, benchmark applications. We also talked about some of the metrics that we use to measure performance. We discussed the benchmark applications for several market segments, uh, including desktops, servers, and uh, embedded processors. So today uh, we'll start with uh, performance. Example: How do you compare? Of, uh, Suppose we have processors B and C with uh, two benchmark applications P1 and P2. A in one second, P2 in 1000. B executes P1 in 10 seconds and P2 in 100 seconds, and C executes P1 in 20 seconds and P2 in 20. Given this data, which of A, B, C is the best one? Right, because you can see one, then A takes the P two. Right, okay. Whereas in both cases, B is in the middle of the of the. Of two benchmark processors, you would be dealing with hundreds of benchmarks. Okay, so you need the application. Meaningful summarization of this data and meaning by meaning it is misleading that that should not lead you to which is actually not the not a good one. Okay. So let's take a uh, take a look at the possible ways that we have. We put the total time to execute P1. So similarly, um, along the same line, it's possible to report the arithmetic mean of the total, right? So it's the same thing in, in these two. Cases. So if you at what you get is on 500 and half, B takes 55 seconds. And C takes 20 seconds to execute P1 and P2. Okay, so according to what it mean, you would conclude that well, C is the best. Say that well, I would go and buy C, right? Do you see any problem with that? P1 may be a more popular. So, um, two to alleviate this problem is the repeated execution. I mean, assigns to everybody, right? So, um, as somebody has already suggested, P1. Which is often very difficult to do. So, what one of, although it probably does not have much meaning as such, you could assign equal time weights with respect to a particular machine. So, what do, what do I mean by that? So if I take machine B, what is that I assign weight to P1 that they take amount of time, right? So, um, equal time weight with respect to B would be P1 getting a weight of 0 0.09 and B get and P2 getting a weight of 0 0.091. Okay. 0 0.909, if you give weightage of 0.909 to uh, P1, you get 90.9 seconds of execution here. Okay. This, is, this will be point, um, um, 0 0.091 uh, weightage to, to uh, program feature. So you might wonder why why should anybody do that? I mean, why why am I picking machine B and equalizing P1 and P2 with respect to B? Well, there may not be any, any reason for that actually. But anyway, so the point here is that with respect to a particular machine, now you can report other things. But it's easy to found there by you know uh, picking a wrong baseline machine. 
The, the other option is to report normalized performance. And that's normally what industry does, and what normally uh, practitioners do. Uh, normalize execution times to some baseline processor. So the point is that when you're designing a new processor, you already have one, right? And you're trying to improve upon that. So it makes sense to specify your performance improvements relative to the current processor. That's often called the baseline processor. Okay. So um, now we are really talking about ratios. So, so, for example, here in this example, if my uh, baseline is A, I would report the performance of B and C with respect to A. Okay. I would say that if I get P1, then B is 10 times slower than, than A, whereas uh, if it is 10 times faster than A, then it will get P2. So, talking about ratios. So, um, how do you summarize ratios? The same question again arises. And again, you have options. You can do arithmetic mean. You can do geometric mean. Um, which one makes sense? The problem is that arithmetic mean. Um, if it, if you take arithmetic mean of time, it's still time. If you take geometric mean of time, it's no longer time. It's something. It's a number. Right? However, geometric mean of ratio has many good properties. So we'll come back to that. Before that, here is an example which shows how geometric mean can be used. Okay. Um, suppose designer of A does an optimization that brings down the time to execute P2 to 500 seconds. Previously, it was 1,000 seconds. Okay. Okay. Designer of B does an optimization that brings down the time to execute P1 to 5 seconds. Previously, it was 10 seconds. Okay. Geometric mean will continue to show these two processes at the same level okay. because the ratio is same actually. Same. What designer of B does is that it halves the execution time of P1, and designer of A does is it halves the execution of P2. Okay, right? So if I if I um, if I take the ratio of these, um, so if I so suppose I'm comparing A and B here, okay, right? So I have two ratios. For P1, the ratio is one over ten. For P2, the ratio is ten here. Okay. I take the geometric mean of them. I take the new optimized machine, machine A and B, I do the same thing, I get the same geometry. Right? So um, <coughs> geometric mean is oblivious to absolute savings. That's, what, that's the problem. Okay. Designer of A is probably smarter than level B, because designer of A was able to save 500 seconds, whereas designer of B did something to save only 5 seconds. So in summary, provide geometric mean or harmonic mean of performance with respect to a baseline. The type of mean really depends on metric. Um, and the point is that don't cheat intentionally. So that's the most important part of the, of the game. Um, now, geometric mean is often used when you uh, mention <coughs> ratios. Okay. Um, and the reason is that um, the geometric mean of the ratio is same as the ratio of the geometric mean of the denominator and the numerator. So it often becomes easier to evaluate. Okay. And people often use harmonic mean also. So how, how are these ordered? Arithmetic mean, geometric mean, harmonic mean? Does anybody remember? <laughs> Which one is the largest? Yeah. Arithmetic mean, right? OK. So um, harmonic mean has the good property that it usually dwarfs your performance improvements, because it is the lowest mean of all the numbers. So if, you're, if you really want to be pessimistic, in terms of reporting your achievement, you might use harmonic mean. So that you are you're on the safe side, that you're not probably uh, being too arrogant or being uh, uh, being, being making, making mistakes in reporting your, your results. Okay. Whereas if you uh, if you really want to magnify your achievement, you might want to report that. Because that's going to be the largest. So as we go on along the course, I'll also mention what mean to use for um, what particular type of measurement. So there are certain things uh, that also need to be taken care of. OK, so any question on this measurement? So summarization. So people usually use means. Um, harmonic mean is, is the most popular one. Sometimes you use geometric mean. You seldom see arithmetic mean. Okay. All right. um, and, um, and usually, these are the statistics that you normally see. Uh, people don't try to go for higher order statistics when reporting or summarizing results. 
OK, so any question? All right. So now we'll uh, talk about a particular law, uh, which is actually common sense. Um, so Jean Amdahl was a PhD student in theoretical physics in Wisconsin Madison, University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, that was in early 50s. So transistors were just coming up. So um, Amdahl developed certain uh, concepts or certain theories in physics um, and certain equations that he needed to solve, which he could not solve analytically. So numerical solutions were required. So Amdahl built a machine, a computer, during his PhD, which is still in the Wisconsin Computer Museum actually available there. Um, and then on, essentially, um, Amdahl stopped doing physics. He was offered a job in IBM and he became a computer engineer. In 1967, he came up with this law, which is essentially common sense. So, which says that it makes a common case fast. <coughs> as simple as that. So, it's quite intuitive. It's, it essentially says that there's no point investing time and money to optimize part of a system that gets invoked 1% of time, for example. You should really be optimizing parts of a program, for example, um, which requires maximum amount of time to execute. So like, for example, if you have a function which gets involved 90% of time, you better invest your time and money to optimize that function. Forget about the remaining portion of the program. Okay, that's, that's actually Amdahl's law. So um, mathematically, if you want to put it, a particular section of the program can be enhanced by some optimization in the processor. So let's suppose x fraction of the entire execution time spent in this particular section of the program. So you're saying that you have a program and certain part of the program can be optimized, either by software or hardware. It doesn't exactly matter how you optimize it. And x fraction of the entire execution time of the original execution is spent in this particular section of the program. The optimization in the processor can speed up execution of the section by y times. Okay. Right. So what does it mean? That means um, the speed up that you get is t over t. t was the previous execution time, which is t over t minus tx, because tx now gets replaced by tx over y. You have sped up this portion by y times. So that's what you get, 1 over 1 minus x plus x over y. So that's the speed up you get, and that's the, you know, that's what I'm now saying. So, and if you look at this particular equation, and um, you may ask several questions, right? That suppose, um, I say that you can get unbounded amount of speed up. So y is infinite. What will happen in that case? The amount of speed up is limited by 1 over 1 minus x. That's the upper bound you can achieve. Whatever you do. So that means that's a very important point. That says that um, <clears throat> the portion of the program that you cannot improve will ultimately become the bottom. Which is actually, again, common sense. Um, so, so the fraction x is measured before the enhancement is applied. So that's a very important thing. It's not measured after the enhancement is applied because that's going to change after you make it. Is it clear? Amdahl's law. Okay. So we apply it in various scenarios. So it just says that you know wherever you can. So here, of course, the, the assumption is that x is large. That's why you spend your time in optimizing. Because you can see that if x is actually uh, not very large, ultimately you get limited by 1 minus x. So, um, so you look for portions of program that takes maximum amount of time to execute. Allocate resources and design time proportionate to execution time. As x increases, the active speed up goes up for at least y. As y increases, speed up remains limited by this. Okay, so that's what we mentioned in the last slide. Amdahl's law is usually used to compare design alternatives. That is, which design would bring more performance. So let's take a very simple example. Um, floating point square root is critical in graphics applications. Two design choices exist. You could implement a floating point square root hardware to improve square root execution by k times. Okay. So that's one design choice. The second choice is improve all floating point instructions 
by two times. So suppose you have these two choices. Which way would you go? So suppose uh, 20 points square root takes 20% of execution time. So this is the portion that we can actually improve. That's what we're thinking about. While 50% time is spent, it's actually spent in all 40 point instructions in the current process. So which design choice is better? So let's work this out. So let's suppose, um, so in the choice one, what do we have? Um, so T1 is the time taken to execute in the, in the first choice, okay. So here we're saying that we're focusing on 20% of our execution time, okay. That is 20 point square root. And we're going to speed that up by 10 times. So what we get is 0.8 remains unchanged, okay? And the remaining 0.2 will get scaled down by 10, right? 10 times, yeah. So what does it give you? That gives you 0.8. So I'm assuming that the original you started with one, execution time was one. Is it clear to everybody? Twice one? What is choice two? We are looking at 50% of time that I, that I could enhance. Okay. So remaining 50% would remain unchanged, so 0.5. And the remaining 50% will get improved by two. Okay. So that will be 0.75. So second choice is clearly better. So I should actually go ahead and try to improve all 40 point instructions. So if you look at, um, so, so clearly, um, of course, in this case, what happened was that accidentally, I would say, that um, the time spent, the 50% time spent on floating point operations, I, since I, I focused on that, I got better <coughs> performance. But it also depends on these two factors. One was 10 times, one was two times. <laughs> so you can easily figure out what this should be so that these two get correlates. So it's not that you can, you can always pick up the major chunk of the time, improve that by some factor, and you're always going to win. No, not that. For example, if I say that this is um, this is 1.5 instead of 2, these two are going to be very close to each other, actually. very close. Right? So, um, and then if I go below 1.5, you can make it 1.2. Just be, you'll actually begin to see that option one will start moving. So you can actually uh, plug in these numbers directly to your Ramdahl's law speed up formula, and you can get the directly the answer without going through this calculation. Okay. Clear? Questions? Okay. All right. So Ramdahl's law um, can be used to derive upper bound on achievable speed up in parallel computer. So. Um, uh, this has, this is used very often to find out a piece of program, to find out the achievable speed up from a particular program. program. So let's see how you do that. Suppose a sequential program takes time t to run on a single processor. Okay. A profiler shows that. So a profiler, for those who do not know, a profiler is essentially a piece of software which takes your program as input and tells you where is time spent how much time is spent in what functions and all. Right. It shows that a fraction s of this time is spent in executing inherently sequential portions of the program. Okay, so that s fraction has no chance of getting parallelized. It's inherently sequential. Okay. The remaining time can be perfectly parallelized for arbitrary number of processes. Suppose you figure that. So what does it mean? So now I can actually deduce the maximum achievable speed up on a machine with t processors. How do I do that? So speed up is sequential time, that is t, divided by the parallel time. What is my parallel time? S times t will remain sequential. And 1 minus S times t will get divided by t, because it gets perfectly parallelized. So that gives me 1 over s plus 1 minus s over t on t processors. I could actually get this get this particular formula directly by plugging in my x and y values in Amdahl's law. It's exactly Amdahl's law. It's essentially saying that I could speed up this part of my execution by p times, all right, leaving these unchanged. 
So what does it tell you? Something interesting tells you. So in the limit, the speed up gets capped at 1 over s. This is the most important part of this analysis. Essentially, it tells you that if I give you infinite number of processors, you cannot get better than this. Impossible. Right? Now, if you look at some of the things, if you plug in values there, you get surprised. Suppose s is 0 0.05. The program is 95% parallelized. The speed up cannot be more than 20. So you might be surprised. I'm running this program on a 32 node machine. It's 95% parallelized. You, you get only 20 speed. You cannot go beyond that. And of course, it ignores communication overhead and many other things. So you're actually, you're not going to get 20 in reality. You even more than that. So essentially, this, this uh, particular analysis tells you that you need almost embarrassingly parallel algorithms with near zero communication to fully utilize even a medium scale parallel computer. By medium scale, I mean you know number of nodes below 50, for example. If you have a 99% parallelizable program, your speed up will go to 100, not more than that. So you need almost completely parallel algorithms. To, to exploit large scale or mid-range mid machines. So that's a very, very uh, important application of Ramdas law. I wanted to mention this, uh, although we probably not use this particular thing in this course. Uh, these are normally used in courses that deal with parallel programs or parallel computer architectures. But keep this in mind. Any question? OK. So um, the next thing that is important for performance measurement is something called the CPI equation. Again, this is common sense. So we have seen that um, we know how to compare two processes. We know how to decide between physical optimizations by applying Amdahl's law. The next question is how do we really measure execution time? Because here we, we knew that, you know, some percentage of execution time cannot be enhanced, some percent can be enhanced, but we need to measure that somehow. Okay. So which are the determinant factors? Assume that we want to calculate the execution time of the program. Okay. So execution time is clock cycles to execute multiplied by cycle time. All right. You take 100 cycles, your cycle time is 1 nanosecond, you require 100 nanoseconds to execute the program. Now, if I extend this particular term, the first term, executed clock cycles, this is equal to number of executed instructions multiplied by average cycles for instruction. Right. So execution time now becomes, if I plug this in, instruction count, that is this one, multiplied by cycles for instructions, that is CPI, multiplied by cycles. So this is the CPI equation. Um, Interesting part of this is that this particular first term is determined by your compiler. The processor has almost nothing to do with it. Your compiler generates your binary, and that's what executes on your processor. That determines how many instructions are executed. Of course, it also depends on your input to the program, because that determines which part of the program gets executed. Cycle time is mostly determined by your underlying semiconductor technology. However, it's often influenced by your architecture also. This one is only influenced by your architecture, cycles for instruction. And that is where an architect holds power. He can do something to improve your CPI. And that's what we're going to invest our time on. Right. We progressively go through phases of improvements to see how we improve CPI. Right. And we'll also mention some of the things to improve cycle time. Okay. Often you will find that these two are interrelated. <laughs> Often you try to improve CPI, you end up sacrificing cycle time. So, um, so you have to keep both of these things in mind. Okay. So cycle time is also the same as reciprocal of frequency. In appropriate units, right? For example, if my frequency is one gigahertz, my cycle time is one nanosecond. 
So execution time equally depends on three components. They're equally weighted, as you can see. Each component can be improved to get reduced execution time. Reducing instruction count of a program normally depends on the instruction set of the processor and the smartness of the compiler. That is separate. So, okay, so let me first try to explain the first part of this. So, um, it says that it depends on instruction set of the processor. So that, that needs some explanation. We talk about instruction set very soon. So roughly speaking, what it means is that uh, the processor supports certain set of instructions. Right? Okay. They may be very complicated. They may be very simple. Right. Now, to do a very complicated operation, the processor may have one instruction. For example, you can think about an operation like copying a string. String means stream of bytes. right? from one part of the memory to another part of the memory. There, there will be just one instruction for doing that. Even though it is doing a lot of copy operations within this particular one instruction. Okay. On the other hand, another processor may be able to maybe may be able to expose this whole thing to the compiler, saying that well, I don't allow you to copy more than four bytes at a time. So you have only have four byte copy instructions. You can copy four byte of data from here to there. So now a string copy would essentially get translated to a for loop, right? which will copy four bytes at a time and complete the whole operation. So there is a trade-off here. In the first case, the CPI is probably going to be very high, even though your instruction count is going to be low. In the second case, the instruction count is going to be large, but CPI is likely to be one, right? or maybe even lower than that. Right? So here's an example. Um, Certain processors um, have separate instructions for doing a comparison, followed by checking the comparison outcome and taking a branch. So, for example, if you have, suppose, um, a piece of C code which does this. Right? Okay. So, um, there are many ways of compiling this. One way could be that you first uh, do x less than or equal to 2, carry out the comparison into one instruction. All right. So that generates some outcome, true false. It may say some flag somewhere. All right. The next instruction goes and checks that flag and decides where to jump, whether to jump or not. If it is actually x less than or equal to 2, you won't jump. <laughs> you just continue executing. Otherwise, you jump to the else part. Or if there is no else part, you just skip the if portion and you start. So these are essentially two instructions, compare followed by a branch instruction. There are other processors who would actually fuse these together, these two operations. We we'll say that branch, so you, you heard this operation actually, and say that branch if greater than. Right. So uh, that's exactly what is saying here. Separate equality check and branch instructions can be fused into one instruction, such as BNE or BEQ. So these are branch not equal to or branch equal depending on the, <coughs> the nature of the comparison. Here I'm showing less than equal to. Here it is talking about um, x equal to equal to 2 or x not equal to 2. So, so in these two cases, essentially what is going to happen is that your instruction count of the program will change. And this was possible in the second case to fuse these two only because the processor actually implemented one such. Right, so that's where this support from instruction set comes into picture. If the instruction set has some instructions, the compiler will be happy to generate such instructions. Otherwise, it cannot generate these instructions. It will break it down into two instructions. Right. Similarly, um, compiler can identify simple optimization. So this, this, this example is purely about compiler optimization. Okay. Ending with a mask and check instead of shift and 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 check. So we're talking about um, something like this. Um, I want to check if, let's say, um, k bit of x is 1. Okay. All right? So there are two ways of doing it. One is that you add x with a mask. Okay. So, so what is that mask? Can somebody guess <coughs> what I'm adding with? <coughs> Sorry? Two to the power of k. Two to the power of k. 
Is that, does everybody see that? What, what I want in the last actually? I want a one in the k position, right? Yes. Okay. Everything else should be zero. Okay, and so, so I, I, I end it with this mask. <laughs> and now it's enough to check whether this is zero or non-zero. Then that would serve my purpose. Exactly, I've done this. The other way of doing it is that I would shift x by k minus 1 bits and then um, do an AND operation. So essentially, uh, x shifted by k minus 1, and then with 0x1, and that would tell me. This is much more expensive than doing this. This is actually two instructions. And followed by a compact. This one is shift and compact. So it, it purely depends on your compiler's smartness. Whether the compiler can figure this out or not. That, oh, I should be actually generating this piece of code, not this. So that's about your instruction count. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about some of these things in the first category, that is how to design instruction set uh, without increasing your CPI too much. Uh, so because, see, there is a, there's a clear balance between your instruction count and CPI. I can make very complicated instructions so that, you know, this entire execution of this if statement, if block, will become one instruction. That's possible, actually. I can do that. But CPI is going to be very high. So there has to be a balance. <laughs> The second component is your CPI, um, and the goal is to minimize okay, CPI. Right. Um, reducing CPI depends on process architecture, namely how much parallelism it can expect. And that's, that's exactly what is going to be the major portion of this course, how to reduce CPI. Um, frequency of a processor depends on semiconductor technology, as well as processor architecture, so as I already mentioned, and that determines your cycle. Component. Architectural enhancements such as deep pipelines to improve frequency may be CPI if not here. So, we, so this one essentially mentions how these two last two terms are actually interrelated. Okay. Saying that um, I can reduce my cycle time, we'll talk about this more in detail, by designing a very deep pipeline. All right? So that each pipe set is doing a very small amount of work so that I can run my clock very fast. Okay. All right? But um, this may increase CPI in many ways. So we'll talk about that. I cannot really mention right now how it can unless we actually see what this pipe stage is up. Yes. So number of bytes you can uh, execute at a time, like you said four bytes you can execute at a time. That is a function of uh, our process and in yes. how our process. So uh, are the or the IC, the instruction count also depends on the processor also. Yes, that so that's what I mentioned, right? It depends on the instructions supported by the processor. So both the compiler and the Yes, yes. So, but once your instruction set is fixed, um, given a program, how many instructions is going to execute will depend on your compiler's smartness. Yes. Whether the compiler is able to generate the optimal number of instructions. That depends on the compiler. So here's an example. Um, so uh, let's take the same example as the last one uh, of the GPU with some additional data. So, uh, the current GPU does not support 40 point square root instruction. And 40 point square root is emulated in software, which means essentially what you do is you implement some square root algorithm. Okay, right? Does anybody know of any algorithm for square root? Yes? Newton's formula? Yes? Newton's formula? Newton Raphson. Newton Raphson. Can, can you be a little more elaborate? It's Who said Newton Raphson? You? Yeah. yeah, it will basically be an approximation algorithm. You yeah. start with an initial guess in, in further cycles. You no, can you just tell me how do I form the neutral graph? How do you set this up? Okay. Uh, neutral graphs method tries to find roots of polynomials. Yeah, so right. basically so you define it as a polynomial. Uh, like What is the polynomial in this case? So square root? fx minus square root of x is equal to 0. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> yeah. What is it? x square minus k is equal to 0. Yes. y square minus c, right? Okay. So I'm trying to evaluate, um, say, a square root of c, right? Yeah. So I would basically take x square minus c equal to c. Yeah. I would find a root for that. So Newton's Raphson's formula, uh, sorry, Newton's Raphson's method is one of the simplest way of uh, doing this. And there are other 
many smart algorithms for evaluating square. Okay. So we're talking about one of those, implementing software. Okay. So clearly if you have a large number of instructions, which means if I look at, uh, if I look at this lump floating point square root operation, it will look like it's a single operation with a large sequence. Um, frequency of floating point instructions is let's say 25%. Average CPI of these instructions is 4. Okay. Average CPI of non floating point square root instructions is 1.33. And frequency of floating point square root operations is 2%. Right? CPI of floating point square root operations is 20. So um, 5 times more than your average of all floating points. So one design alternative was to reduce CPI of a floating point square root by 10 times, that is by coming, bringing it to 2 from 20, right? The other alternative was to reduce CPI of all floating point operations by half, so 4 to 2, right? So which one is better? So uh, the question that still remains is, any question? Is how do you really still get these three parameters? Right? We require um, number of instructions, CPI, and the cycle time okay, to measure execution time. So CPU designers normally use uh, detailed simulators to get exact behavior of program execution. Um, simulations can be done at different levels of accuracy. So here are a um, few options. Uh, there is one called trace-driven simulation, where you obtain a trace of X execute an instructions um, and feed the trace into a simulator, which essentially simulates the processor. Right? So trace goes to the simulator and what comes out is of course number of instructions that we execute. Okay. Which of course you can already get from the trace because you already have the trace. However, it, you also get the cycles for instruction and you know the cycle time of the processor. Okay. The problem with trace driven simulation is that complex interaction in pipeline is not possible to model because you obtain the trace by running the program on some machine. Now your simulator, your, the process that you're trying to simulate may be different from that machine, but there is no way to model those interactions. The trace of instructions is already fixed by that execution right, on that machine. So exactly what you cannot model, we'll come back to that. Um, the, the most important thing is that you fail to model the trace driven simulation. But in most cases, this is okay. The best possible option is to do an execution driven simulation. What is that? It's an accurate model of the processor and memory system designed in software and programs are run on this simulator. So essentially what we do is this simulator can actually take the binary of the program as an input and can interpret the binary, meaning decode the binary and actually can execute the binary. Okay, all right. So it's just like a machine executing your program. So these are most accurate and also most time consuming simulation. A user can exploit the performance counters to get a rough estimate of time spent on certain code segments and the number of instructions in those segments. Uh, frequency is already known. Right? So today's machines already offer a large number of performance counters to measure performance. From those you can get um, estimate of time spent in certain codes and Static profiling of the program can also provide some information about instruction distribution. So you can also profile your program to know what type of instruction you have in what percentage. For example, you can find out information like I have 20% floating point instructions, I have 60% load store instructions, and so on and so forth. So, um, a few locality, uh, sorry, a few principles that you should keep in mind. One is a uh, principle of locality. We'll also elaborate on that soon. Um, and we have, I have already mentioned in the last class that programs are not random pieces of code. Right? So it turns out that 90% of time is spent in 10% of code. So it's a rule of thumb, although I'm, it's an average estimate. Of course, there are exceptions. But in general, that's what you will find. And the simple reason is that the most in interesting programs would have some kind of repetitive structures, either in the form of loop or in the form of recursion. Otherwise, if you don't have any of these, it's essentially a straight line piece of program doing pretty much nothing interesting. Right? 
So any interesting piece of code would have loops or recursions, and you probably spend a lot of time executing the loop or the recursive structure. And that's where this small piece of code uh, would essentially lead to a large amount of time spent. Same locality, so this is essentially saying locality in terms of code, code locality. I spend a lot of time in one locale of the code. Okay. Same locality principle applies to data access also. So uh, there are two types of locality that we talk about when talking about code and data. One is called spatial locality, which means that closely spaced data are accessed closely in time. Temporal locality, which says that currently accessed data are likely to be accessed in near future. Right? Exploit locality in design, for example, caches try to exploit temporal locality because what you're touching now will be cached, hoping that in future, near future, you'll be touching that again. While prefetching exploits spatial locality, because what prefetching does is that if you're touching data word x, you would also prefetch maybe x plus 1, x plus 2, x plus 3, x plus 4. Okay. So it's trying to exploit spatial locality. Say that, well, you're touching x, so maybe you'll be touching nearby data also. 